All right. I'll go ahead and get started. So good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us um, for our Open Access Week uh, presentation workshop looking at open access at MU and some of the major ways that the MU libraries engage with open access principles to provide services to the university community and to the world. Uh, I'm Stephen Pryor, Digital Scholarship Librarian for the MU Libraries, and joining me a little bit later will be Corey Hutchinson, Associate University Librarian for Acquisitions, Collections, and Technical Services. And today we'll be looking at uh, some of the basics of open access, uh, ways that readers and authors can assess the quality of open access journals, uh, your library, that's us, <laughs> and open access, and then our roles in open access, and so that's all of us together, authors, um, readers, and the library. All right, so to start off talking about uh, open access basics, um, one thing that I want to point out is that uh, from time to time I'll ask for feedback from everybody. And so uh, down at the bottom of your Zoom window, you should have a reaction button, um, primarily the green check mark and maybe the red X um, under your reactions. And so I'll ask for a little bit of feedback. And if you could acquaint yourself with those buttons, we can use that for a little bit of uh, sort of informal polling as we go along. Uh, and feel free to uh, let us know any comments or anything in the chats as well. Um, and before I get too far along, uh, I kind of went straight into the introduction there. Um, I want to recognize Joe uh, Askins. He's with us also. He's our um, um, he's with our uh, instruction group, and he did a lot of organization for this workshop. And I want to make sure um, that I didn't miss anything in the introduction. I think we're good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hi, thank everyone. you. Thanks, Joe. Um, all right. So by way of our green and red buttons, um, how many of the people who are here so far have published something and made it available open access as far as as far as you know? See, since I'm the presenter, my reaction button is hidden. All right, so five, six, three. Great. Um, and now uh, go ahead and change that reaction if necessary. How many of you have uh, read something that somebody else has made available open access? Again, as far as you know. All right, great. So um, just from that, I can tell that we've got a little bit of an idea in this group as to the basics of open access. Um, this definition is from Peter Suber. He's the uh, director of the Harvard Office for Scholarly Communication. Uh, he's also involved in um, the uh, uh, Associate of, uh, Association of Research Libraries uh, work around open access. Uh, and he defines these basics of open access as, first of all, open access literature is online, free to read, and free of most copyright and licensing restrictions. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that can mean in a second. What OA is not is it's not an attempt to bypass peer review and just put everything uh, online with no review. It's not an attempt to tell people where they have to publish or restrict academic freedom in any way or relax rules against plagiarism or copyright. Um, OA is not an attempt to deny the reality of costs that, that publishing the scholarly research costs somebody something. Uh, and the way that he puts it is that the question is not necessarily whether research literature can be made costless, but whether there are better ways to pay the bills than charging the readers and creating access barriers and paywalls to disseminating that information. And finally, uh, open access is not a means 
to reduce authors' rights over their work. Uh, you think, well, you know, I put it online and that's it. You know, it's, it's out of my control. And in fact, uh, open access requires an author to exercise more of their own rights than under traditional publishing contracts where you sign it over to, just to, just to use a big name, you, see, <laughs> you sign over your, some rights to Elsevier for them to publish an article, right? Um, you, th then Elsevier or, or whomever gets to decide what happens with that article. Right. And so uh, in a lot of ways, exercising your rights under open access requires you to to retain and control uh, more control over your work than in traditional schemes. Don't worry, I'll zoom in on this a little bit. Um, but when we talk about open access or making something available with an open access license, there is not a one quote quote, open access license, okay? Uh, open access is a whole spectrum of uh, rights and restrictions that can be applied to a work. Uh, and on this, let's see if my laser pointer works here. So down at the bottom, we have closed access and then the spectrum goes up to open access. And then across left to right, we've got who are these rights for and what do they do? So we have rights for readers, rights for reuse, copyright, who, who maintains the copyright, author posting, automatic posting, and then machine readability. Uh, one thing that, that some people don't think about is whether um, their document will uh, be able to be used for, for text mining uh, projects or um, automated uh, taxonomy development or th things like that. Um, and that is also included in uh, the spectrum of rights that we can apply. And so starting, for example, for reader rights down here under closed, we've got subscription, membership, pay-per-view, or other fees required to read all articles, all the way up to some but not all articles, free for all after an embargo of six months, free to all after less than six months, and then free immediately upon publication. And so that's an example just for the reader rights. Uh, and then similarly, we've got how can it be reused, remixed, who is allowed to do it? Um, and then what are you as an author giving away uh, under a particular license that you uh, sign for your work? And are you allowed to post it? Um, so most restrictive publisher holds copyright with no author reuse beyond fair use, um, all the way up to things like author retains and grants to the publisher rights to publish and reuse. So the author retains the copyright, but is granting the publisher the right to make copies and disseminate that work. Uh, and then all the way up to no restrictions. Uh, so the point here is that that's a spectrum of um, Sorry, I was hoping to be able to uh, copy these links. Uh, <laughs> it's a, a spectrum of rights granted uh, under various uh, collection of licenses. And typically we see OA described like this. Um, and so how many of you are familiar with gold, green, hybrid, bronze, uh, and have seen that terminology before? Um, so this is how we see it a lot of times when we are searching in, in library databases that include open access materials um, or uh, when talking about publishing a paper. We might use this shorthand for various types of open access licenses. Uh, and what they sort of mean is that um, gold is published in a completely open access journal. 
and we'll look at how to identify those in a little bit. Um, so uh, it is immediately open access uh, to the world upon publication. Uh, oftentimes, not all the time, oftentimes there's a fee involved to make that happen. There is also green open access, which is um, toll access on the publisher page, but a free copy in an OA repository. And we'll definitely get back to that later. Uh, and then there's the hybrid model, which is a subscription journal. And if you've published in a subscription journal, you'll know that they will send you a document and say, uh, if you wanna make this article open access, it'll cost you $3,000 for this low fee of $3,000. Uh, it'll be uh, immediately available free worldwide, right? Um, so there's a model where you can, you can publish no cost to the author in a subscription journal, and then people have to pay to read it. Or in that same journal, uh, you can pay the open access fee and it'll be free to everyone to read. Then there's a squishy category of bronze, which for one reason or another, the publisher has made it available for free, uh, maybe temporarily, maybe because it's related to a hot topic like COVID-19 or something like that. Uh, and they don't necessarily apply a specific license to it. And then closed is all other articles that uh, aren't available online freely, including those shared only on a social network or illicit pirate file sharing service um, not to be named. So um, that's kind of an important point too. A lot of people um, are encouraged or um, uh, the, the social networks, academia.edu or ResearchGate, will um, give you these nice features and incentives and connect you to people and all of these things. And they, they really try to get you to post your full text. Um, what happens when you have thousands, hundreds of thousands, uh, perhaps millions of people involved in a social network like this, uh, not all of it is posted legally under the correct versions or licenses. And so when we look at what is um, correctly available open access, uh, most of the time we don't count and our library databases don't count um, things from those social networks because they may not be completely on the up and up. And when a big publisher it sometimes makes the the news, certainly in certainly in library circles, maybe other academic circles, chronicle of higher education and the like. When a big publisher sends a takedown request to of millions of articles from ResearchGate, um, things like that. And so the point is that uh, these are shorthand for uh, specific licenses applied by authors and or publishers that spell out the details on that spectrum of who can redistribute the work, who can remix it, whether it can be converted to other forms or processed in certain ways. Um, and now finally, we can talk about why would you want to choose an open access license? And um, the main one is more exposure for your work. You think, well, you put it out there, it's now it's in uh, Google Scholar for free and, and anybody who searches it can, can get the PDF right away and, and read it. And so there's certainly more exposure. Um, researchers in developing countries or um, uh, perhaps uh, poorer parts of the world or uh, in you know, fields that aren't uh, particularly monetized, um, those researchers can see your work without the expensive subscriptions. Uh, taxpayers in general often don't uh, necessarily have access to expensive databases and journals. 
Um, and so along with that, the public can access the findings of your research. And, you know, as a state land grant university, we uh, need to be aware of making sure that our uh, stakeholders around the state can have access to uh, our research findings. Um, and similarly to that, our research can, can influence policy. Uh, if it is disseminated widely um, and everyone has access to it, uh, it can be used um, in support of policy, uh, as well as in practice. And so some fields specifically are practitioner focused. So certainly a lot of medical or veterinary or nursing uh, are practitioner based, but uh, also um, it's super important for less funded, I guess I could say, <laughs> uh, practitioner fields like social work or education. Uh, and then finally, what grabs a lot of people's attention is this talk ar around higher citation rates. Um, and so as a researcher, you're of course interested in uh, your own uh, H index or uh, how often people are citing you. Uh, and there's been a lot of research around this, whether it actually exists. And uh, probably for the last couple of decades, study after study has shown that there tends to be a higher citation rate for open access papers versus um, all papers in general. Okay, and what this graph is showing us is that for those different types of open access that we talked about earlier, completely closed, that weird bronze category where it's generally a subscription journal, but for some reason it's free, freely available. The hybrid journal, which is typically a subscription journal, but somebody has paid for an open access article. Fully gold and uh, green, typically a paywalled article that somebody has deposited a legal copy of in an institutional repository, or uh, sometimes there are subject-based repositories. And so the interesting thing here is um, you know, it's pretty clear across closed papers, um, the average relative citations of the open access copies are uh, quite significantly higher. Um, and the interesting one to me that jumps out here is the gold, um, but that is um, a possible reason for that is that gold means those fully open access journals. And so a lot of those journals might be relatively newer journals and not yet at least quite have the reach. Uh, some of these fully gold journals are uh, spin-offs from their traditional hybrid journals. Uh, so it might be a similar title or a similar editorial team, but it's just a related uh, spinoff that is fully OA. Um, and so because it might be a relatively small group of journals um, comparatively new to the to the more longstanding journals that would be under the hybrid model or even uh, green could explain that. I just thought that was an interesting data point. And then when we ask faculty about uh, what their, uh, how they would define open access. And so this study was done uh, in the UK actually, and they asked um, a few hundred faculty members to uh, name some concepts to define open access. Uh, and the top one is accessibility and availability followed pretty clearly by cost to publish and reputation, as well as quality. Uh, quality and reputation together make up 20% of the faculty reported, um, you know, those uh, sorts of concerns. 
And so as a library, uh, one of the things that we um, work on is that we work with uh, you, our users, readers and authors to, to find and locate quality open access journals and articles. And so some, some of the ways, just some of the ways that we can do that are for readers, for example, you are, you are looking for a journal article for your research. Um, no judgment, <laughs> but how many people uh, are familiar with our Discover at MU search? Um, so library.missouri.edu, Discover at MU is our, our main um, uh, our main article search, kind of a window to the broadest range of materials we have. Uh, other databases, if you're familiar with Scopus or Web of Science, they also uh, include uh, similar uh, listings designating open access materials and things like that. But just as an example, we'll look at Discover M at MU, our main search. Uh, and if you were to do a search here, uh, and you would get some sort of result. We have our find it button, find it at MU. So uh, if the full text doesn't come up right away because it's in the same database, we, ha we have a find it button that says, well, let's, let's search our whole collection. That's, that's our button there. And so if the full text doesn't pop up right away and you click find it at MU, uh, you'll see a screen like this where it tries to find a copy. It gives you the option to ILL it if necessary. And if I blow that up, this is what it looks like when um, the article that you're looking for uh, is available somewhere else out on the web in an open access version. All right, and this might be a green version. It might be a bronze somewhere, uh, but there's a database that that looks to go out and find uh, all of these uh, scholarly articles in an open access version. And so uh, we integrate that into our searches so that even if we don't have an article, if it is available open access, uh, you can click through and get access to it. Other tools for readers are some browser extensions um, such as Unpaywall. And uh, at the end, I will try to, to paste in uh, a lot of links. I um, unfortunately am not able to, uh, <laughs> to select and copy the links. Um, but Unpaywall, again, if you are searching and you, you hit that, that paywall uh, on an article site, Unpaywall is a browser extension that gives you a little button down the corner of your screen uh, that will show whether that article shows up in the open access database somewhere. Okay, so if you're outside of our library search, Unpaywall can, can help you. Um, and then Open Access Button is a similar browser extension. Uh, we have uh, online resources and directories like the Directory of Open Access Journals. So. Uh, any of those journals that are um, where the article is counted as gold open access, uh, those journals are going to be listed in the directory of open access journals, typically. Um, and so you can check there to see if a journal is legitimate, or you can search there for a subject area uh, or uh, keywords to find open access journals in your field. And then finally, uh, library.missouri.edu slash contact us, or if you just go to the library homepage and there's that slide out, ask a librarian, that'll also get you there. Um, ask, ask a librarian <laughs> uh, if you have any questions about uh, whether an article that you found has, um, is a quality article or in a quality journal, feel free to, uh, hit up this link, there's the subject librarian tab. Uh, 
that'll let you find a specific librarian or you can chat with the librarian that's available. For authors, uh, we um, have some advice that we provide. Um, a lot of us have received emails um, because we, we have .edu email addresses or we've gone to conferences or we've gotten on some sort of mailing list or another. Uh, and we get these emails that the journal of such and such, you know, really wants your paper, right? Or um, you have an idea for a paper and you're looking for a journal to, uh, to publish it, to submit. Um, and so when you're trying to make this uh, determination, it's sort of a three-step process uh, and again, another, another link, another website think, check, submit. All right, so uh, the first step is to think about uh, whether this journal that you're thinking that that is maybe soliciting you or that you're thinking about submitting to, uh, is it a trusted journal or a trusted publisher? And is it the right journal? Uh, and then this site also has a checklist to assess the journal or the publisher. Uh, is it known in the field? Do your peers know what it is? Does it show up in any of these lists? Is it in the directory of open access journals? Is it um, in uh, the uh, um, is it in the library database indexes? Okay, and so uh, this site again uh, provides you a whole uh, checklist of things to check. And then if you can answer yes to those questions on the checklist, um, you can uh, feel pretty good that, that it's a good journal. Um, some of the other things that we can look at in assessing uh, journal quality for, for an open access journal are uh, typical metrics. Um, I'm not going to poll everybody, everybody if they know uh, what all of these are, um, but they're basically factors of, uh, you know, including things like how often are articles in this journal uh, cited in the literature, um, what are, are their authors well known, um, do the um, uh, do they get attention in uh, alt metrics, which is sort of like a, a social media or you know retweets of the DOI or uh, um, lots of different uh, sort of uh, alternative metrics other than citations? Uh, does the journal do peer review? What is their peer review process like? Um, and then finally. Uh, not necessarily finally, but finally, <laughs> finally for, for this slide, um, is the journal included in these directories, like the Directory of Open Access Journals, or are they a member of the Open Access Scholarly Publishers Association? Are they on the academic analytics journal list? Um, could be something that, that you would wanna know. All right, and again, I will definitely have these links at the end in the chat. Um, all of those, the, the metrics, the citations, the, the site score, the impact factor, um, it varies by discipline. Uh, it varies by field. Uh, we have some resources on this guide, libraryguides.missouri.edu slash where to publish, that um, kind of walk you through where to get those numbers. So, uh, you know, here's, here's a link for the site score, you know, type in your journal, and here's how to read it. Uh, so we have a lot of that kind of information there. Uh, what I really want to stress to is that you can find your subject librarian and your subject librarian knows the field, they know the journals and they know how to search and find information about these journals. Um, 
So I will quiz. Uh, how many people know who their subject librarian is? If you've already met them or talked to them. Fantastic. That's a good number. All right. And if you haven't, I, again, that contact us tab has a subject librarians list and you can go down and find your discipline or department. Sometimes it's a little confusing, but you can reach out. Um, if you're not sure where you are, just reach out to the librarian. Um, I was chatting with, with one of our subject librarians about this presentation earlier today. And um, she said, be sure to encourage people to contact a subject librarian if they're uncertain about a journal. I evaluate journals all the time for people. It's fun to do. And sometimes you come up with interesting findings, end quote. All right, so um, definitely hit up that link, find your subject librarian. All right, so um, other things. So those are things where we help readers and we help authors find uh, open access materials to use or to publish in. We have a whole spectrum of other activity within the libraries around open access. Um, and for a discussion of a major uh, activity on that front, uh, I see that Corey is, is with us and I will turn it over to her. Thank you, Stephen. Um, hi, I'm Corey Hutchinson. I'm the Associate University Librarian for Collections Technical Services and Acquisitions. And currently I'm responsible for the units that negotiate with publishers for the content that we provide, our journals, the online journals that we provide, the print materials, the books, and so forth. So currently, especially with the big five, we actually negotiate directly for that content. So your favorite journals, we negotiate with them directly and say, we want these journals for the year, what's the cost, and so forth. And so um, it's really only an access model that we work towards. But as open access has continued very slowly in library land to take foot. And as I feel like finally starting to gain some traction, publishers are realizing that libraries want to do more than just pay for access to content because it still puts it behind a paywall. It still leaves it behind a paywall for the majority of scholars. Um, I only pay for access that is available at MU, for example. So is there a way I can work with a publisher to um, pay for continued access for my patrons to read the content, but also work with them because the faculty are the ones providing the articles by which then I turn around and pay for. So this is kind of bringing rise to the transformative agreements is what we're calling them, are basically new discussion topics where libraries are trying to negotiate the costs of publishing an article, open access, into the agreements that we make with these publishers for also um, what's called content access or read access. So if I'm ready for the next slide. Because I do want to point out, and I'm if Stephen said it, I'm going to reiterate it. Open access does not mean it's free. It's not free to host. It's not free to edit. Some of these are still peer reviewed. I know we have several editors and we have several peer reviewers. Some are paid, some aren't. They still need to be hosted. It still needs to go through the system. So hosting an article open access does not necessarily mean that it's free to host to open access. So we are moving towards transformative agreements where, for example, I'm negotiating with a variety of publishers to have MU affiliated authors materials when you're the corresponding author or the contributing author to have the expense to pay for that to be open access. The expense is often called the APC or author publishing charges. And then what that allows is your article in that journal whether um, to be published open access. Now, and this is usually for hybrid journals. I know we looked at green, gold, bronze, and so forth, but these are mostly for non um, gold because these would be journals where the article otherwise would be behind a paywall if that those charges are not paid and covered. So a few examples of some of these types of agreements 
that we see are read and publish, which kind of goes back to what I just mentioned, an, an agreement where a portion of our fee goes to essentially pay for access to read the articles, and the other portion pays for the publishing costs that MU affiliated faculty members would come up with to publish their work open access. Um, thank you. There are also fully published only agreements where it can be an agreement where the publishing house moves all open access and everything published has to be has to have an APC or publishing charge covered. And then there really isn't a read part because everything is published open access. And then it's um, dependent upon the author to pay for that open access charge. There's Diamond OA, which is common in societies or um, maybe journals that are funded by um, grants, where the hosting of the journal and the articles is already funded by an outside resource. And so you can publish OA just by merely contributing to that journal. So I think Diamond is, you know, it's kind of, I know that we have the green gold, it's kind of like bronze and platinum and you throw in all these names, but I think Diamond is meant to be kind of the pinnacle that it's an established journal that is free to pay, free to publish in, and then it is open access. And then another common kind that you may have heard of is subscribe to open. This is common among some annual reviews titles, not all of them, but some with the idea that there is a revenue threshold that annual reviews sets and if they get enough subscribers to that journal in that particular year, then it becomes open access if that threshold is met. Um, it can be a little bit tricky because if you don't get to that threshold, then it doesn't go to open and some people will cancel their subscriptions because they think it's going to be open. So the funding stops um, flowing. So it's not perfect. And I will say actually none of these ones that I've given that are examples, this is clearly not exhaustive are perfect because we're always trying to, as a library, I'm trying to find a way to balance how to ensure patrons get the content they need to read mixed with the ability to support open access so that in the future everyone can read and um, trying to stay within our budget. Often transformative agreements are not, they do not cost less than we are currently paying. They often cost a little bit more and you sometimes have to be willing to do that if you feel that, if, I think that's worth it if we feel that we can then help to promote um, MU affiliated publications by our authors. Um, some of the agreements such as publish only can be a problematic situation if, for example, your institution has high output and now all of a sudden you're, you're paying not to read the content, you're paying a three or $4,000 per article in a year fee and you publish 100 articles a year, now all of a sudden you have a $300,000 charge to publish those articles when maybe you were only paying 25,000 to read them. So a lot of times these transformative agreements either have to be phased in or they're negotiated or sometimes they don't make it past the discussion stage merely because they are expensive in some ways to move forward. As publishers, of course, are interested in maintaining bottom line, they have a business to support, and then we have a mission to support to ensure that our patrons get their content and can publish. So I'm actually ready for the next slide, please. So I did want to talk just about a few examples that we do have here at MU, and one is from Cambridge University Press. This is a read and publish. So essentially a part of my fee also goes to allow, to cover the costs to publish articles open access. And it has a cap. Um, and this cap is based on our annual output over the last, I think three or five years. And so if you publish in any Cambridge University journal, when you go through the author uh, portal to submit and process that submission, there's an opportunity to ask the university libraries to cover the cost to make that open access. Um, it's brand new, this is our first year that we've done it and we still have some kinks to work out, but we're very excited because this also covers um, some of our humanities and social sciences journals because a lot of sciences journals, some grants can sometimes help with open access charges. Um, so we're very excited about Cambridge we also have Company of Biologists, which is another 
read and publish style agreements where it's actually system wide and there is no article cap. So any faculty member can publish in a company biologist journal and if they um, corresponding or contributing author labels themselves as a University of Missouri um, faculty member, then it's free for them to publish open access. And the best thing I like about some of these read and publish with Cambridge and Company of Biologists, especially is if the journal that you wanna publish in provides the opportunity to publish open access, you don't have to switch journals. You don't have to compromise the impact factor. You don't have to change the distribution avenue that you're used to. We're just trying to provide avenues for you to do what you normally do and have that article be open access. So these are the only two that we have on the table right now, but um, we have explored um, ACM, which is the Association for Computing Machinery. They have a deal on the table we've, we've looked at. Um, we've been reaching out to IGI Global, and I'm hoping to get a deal with Wiley that would be a read and publish deal that would also allow us to help support some open access publishing in any of their journals as well. Those are all in discussion. And again, as I said before, it's trying to balance the costs and the benefits that come with the content. So, and that's five publishers because not all publishers are kind of jumping into this idea of working with libraries to do transformative agreements, for example. Um, Wiley is the biggest one, but Oxford's starting to come up. Elsevier has a deal with California if you want to look into it. I don't personally think it's the best deal ever, um, but they are very hesitant to go down that road. Springer has deals in Europe, but we haven't really seen a widespread offering or acceptance of deals through some of these publishers. So it's not there yet, but it doesn't mean that there aren't ways for you to publish your articles open access that we do provide access to. And so with that, I leave it to Stephen to take that forward. Okay, uh, before you run away, <laughs> so so uh, I um, back back when I started repository work uh, many years ago. Now I had this dream. I thought, well, okay, you know, we're we're doing these things and we're making some of these articles available, and some people are paying to publish, and and some people are paying to read and uh, that all seems very confusing. Wouldn't it be great if we took the pot of subscription money and just flipped it, <laughs> you know, uh, so that everybody could read it, but somebody, somebody does still have to, to pay to make it happen. And it kind of sounds like these kinds of deals are an acknowledgement of that, but it's very much in that messy middle space. Is that right? There is a lot of gray area. Exactly. So uh, I had a recent deal that we looked at with a um, very large research institution, and they were actually my example of the hundred, you know, they were paying $25,000, $30,000 for access. And then if we move to a, they just pay for publication, all of a sudden now they're paying $100,000, $150,000. And so while it, and conceptually, yes, if everybody does it, right? Like, so that's the, that's the beauty is that we all kind of move to where we're starting to continue to cover the publishing charges then long-term. And then in theory, right, you pay less. Everyone gets that, it becomes more prevalent. So you're paying less in the long run. But it's also, I feel like coming at a time when a lot of libraries just don't have that initial investment as enrollments have, have kind of shrunk. Um, a lot of institutions are state, a lot of large research institutions are state supported. Those budgets have shrunk. So and I think the publishers, to be honest, are in a, a, an unhappy place with their revenue models. And so nobody's figured out the revenue model. And it feels a little bit like everyone was kind of like Napster and sharing. And I'm showing my age, right? Showing music that they don't really know what it means for their bottom line long term. And so it's easier to stay with the model you have than to try to really move it forward. And it's really a, a game changer for how they do business. And I honestly just don't think that anybody's figured out a way for everybody to get what they want to feel stable. So I think it's very, very gray right now. I would agree with that. Right. And, um, you know, one of, one of the things that usually comes up is because, you know, there, there are these deals, but then, you know, some universities have, you um, 
you know, the, the library pays for a certain number, you know, there's some, there's some pool of, of open access uh, tickets, maybe, maybe not outside of this deal, but a certain number of articles. Um, and, you know, to be clear, a lot of times what, what everybody wants from these kinds of deals is revenue neutral, <laughs> you know, for, for the library to make grants to authors, you know, costs a lot of money. And, and our budget is the same as everybody else's around here in that we have really looked at that, um, but haven't quite been able to make that happen. But we're, we're working on making this happen in a way that that is within our means, right? Right. And do you, I'm going to answer the question quickly in the chat by oh, Jim. Sure. So part of the company of biologists deal, I don't remember. My apologies, I can't remember off the top of my head if you have the, I think you have the choice to publish open access if you choose at no additional cost to you if you are the author. Um, so I think that they probably still allow you to choose um, traditional publishing models if you want. But um, if you want to go the open access route, then yes, my negotiation deal, as long as you affiliate yourself with the University of Missouri, um, will allow you to open access without any additional charge. I hope that that's clear. If not, I'm happy to follow up. I'm going to take a note. Oh, fabulous. Thank you. And actually, if you bring up another point too, is that, you know, I would love to have the happy problem that then the publisher comes back to me and says that you have too many faculty publishing in our materials. And then what it means is, you know, we're really getting our content out to the public, which to me is also a mission, as Stephen said, of being land grant is to promote our content. So yes, we're happy to do so. All right. Awesome. Thanks for your time, Stephen. I'll stick around in case questions, other questions come up. Please throw them in the chat if you have any. I'm happy to answer. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. Um, so with that, you know, we're we're working on new licensing deals, um, and that's an exciting area of work that's going on in the library. Um, that's a relatively recent development for these kinds of deals, uh, but we also have. Um, <clears throat> other other work where we support open access dissemination, and a major one of those is uh, by promoting, allowing, supporting, uh, and and really uh, encouraging self archiving for authors. Um, and so again, I'll I'll ask for the green check marks. Um, how many of you knew that that most publishers, uh, any of the the major publishers? these days, most of them by default allow you to include some version of your work, usually your copy after peer review, the last one you submit to the journal, in an institutional repository. So a lot of people uh, are not aware of that. So, you know, if I don't see your, your green check mark, that's fine. Uh, the publishers really try to hide it to you because when they send you the information about open access options, um, you know they're they're promoting that gold or the hybrid with the APC. Uh, they want you to pay, and that makes that's great. That's great. It makes the official version of the work, the the publisher's copy of that work, available, free, immediate, open access. If if you pay for that gold or uh, hybrid uh, open access license through the publisher. Uh, a lot of times somewhere on their site, they have a provision for the green open access. Um, most publishers allow green open access, which allows for that final manuscript to be posted in a repository, such as an institutional or a disciplinary repository. Uh, and uh, Sherpa Romeo, is an online database where you can go and look up a journal and it gives you a uh, breakdown of what you um, what that publisher's policies are for self archiving for authors. And so you can go to Sherpa Romeo and check you can ask your subject librarian and check you can email MoSpace and check. 
And so speaking of MoSpace and self-archiving a copy of an article in an institutional repository, uh, mospace.umsystem.edu. We've got a couple more links for the chat here. But. Um, the open access guide uh, has a link on it that um, has a list of those deals that Corey just talked about and some other ones. And then the, our MoSpace repository link is there too. Um, and MoSpace is the digital institutional repository for the University of Missouri, available for faculty and researchers to disseminate and preserve their research. And as the author, we, we have whole workshops, so check our workshop schedule. We have workshops on author's rights, copyright, um, and I think some of those are coming up in the next week or so. So uh, check our the library website for um, links to those. But um, you know, just to say that the author is the copyright holder until you sign it over to somebody else. And the copyright holder can control decisions about how it's reproduced, distributed, displayed, or performanced. And so we encourage you to know and use your rights. Think about how you want to distribute your work um, and review your publisher agreement to make sure that it um, does what you want it to do for you as the author and also that it complies with any funder requirements. So when we're talking about self-archiving in an institutional repository, a lot of times that is sort of a minimum level of open access availability that can comply with a grant requirement to make a work available open access. <clears throat> okay, and so this is a um, screenshot of one of those Sherpa Romeo entries for a journal advances in chemi chemical physics. Uh, we have the information about the publication. It's a Wiley publication. Uh, and then under publisher policy, it tells us what their default uh, self-archiving policy is. And so when you look up a journal that you've published in, in Sherpa Romeo, it'll tell you um, the accepted version, that's your final manuscript version, can be posted in an institutional repository. Uh, for this one, it's after 12 months. The published version, you cannot, you're not permitted to, to post that in a repository or on ResearchGate or, or you know, wherever. Uh, so that publisher's PDF has to stay published by the publisher, but your final post peer review manuscript, the, the accepted version can go into an institutional repository. And then there's some other stuff, some other places over here, non-commercial disciplinary repositories after 12 months. So when you go to mospace.umsystem.edu and hit that submit work link up in the top corner, you submit your article, you submit your manuscript to us, we'll check it and make sure that it's the correct version, that it complies with the publisher requirements. Uh, and then we'll, we'll post that manuscript up in MoSpace. And everything that goes up into MoSpace has a statistical view and we can view statistics on a whole collection like this. And this is actually for the entire repository all the way down to the item level. You can see how many people have downloaded it, how many people have uh, viewed the metadata. Um, and then at the collection level, we can see you know top authors, most popular downloads and things like that. Um, one of the things that we look at is um, how our MU authors are publishing their work. And so uh, for uh, 2019, this is a chart of uh, how many articles published by MU authors are available in some form of open access. And that's our green and uh, blue is hybrid. And then we've got gold and, and bronze. Um, and so this non-red slice here is our percentage of articles available open access. And so that is um, about 40%, if I remember correctly. And the other 60% is closed, currently closed. 
And one of the things that I've done is I've gone through and looked at the publishers and compared the publishers against a list that has these green open access policies. And at least this chunk of these closed articles could be available online through our most based repository. So almost uh, 80, probably honestly 90%. A bigger chunk of these, uh, if I really tracked down all of these in this slice, could be available through these uh, green open access policies and manuscript deposit. Uh, so, I mean that's that's quite a that's quite a gap, and all we need you to do is uh, submit those manuscripts. And we're working on other projects where we're making those easier to submit. Uh, contacting authors directly and um, requesting those submissions and things like that. Uh, <clears throat> and then just to sum up your role to choose the right journal and know your OA options, we want you to use your rights. Uh, if you are an editor or a manuscript reviewer, know what the OA culture is like at the journal. Uh, that you're that you're reviewing for, um, how much do they cost? Uh, society publications are another big source of uh, open access journals. Um, they're supported or underwritten by the society sometimes, um, or have um, you know, philosophical um, pursuit of open access to scholarship. Um, so we encourage you to, to know your rights and to know what is up with the journals that you work with. And then for us, uh, we provide platforms for publication and dissemination, such as MoSpace um, and others, and hopefully others in the future. Uh, and you can contact your librarian. We provide advice, consultation, and assistance on journal quality and impact, author rights, copyright. We have workshops on all of these things on our workshop schedule um, and you can uh, arrange an appointment or a consultation with, with any of our librarians or your, your subject librarian also. Uh, and then we have all of these other activities such as negotiating these new transformative agreements um, where uh, those OA opportunities that are immediate access and, and normally paid uh, might now start to become included in our uh, read agreements or some of the other stipulations or things that Corey described. All right, uh, I wanna throw up a list of some of those links and then if there are any questions, I know we're right up at four o'clock. Um, so a final quiz, I pasted all of those links into the chat earlier, I think. Uh, so one last quiz, green check marks. Um, well, actually for this one, go ahead and throw it in chat. Um, just, just one way that you can find out more about journal quality, uh, where to deposit your manuscript or what your OA options are with the publisher. Just choose your favorite and drop it in the chat, please, before we go. All right, well, thank you for joining us. Yes, libraryguides.missouri.edu. Yep, we have, we have an open access guide. We have the where to publish guide. We have a MoSpace guide. Uh, we have a data management guide. So uh, your data sets can go into MoSpace for open data and open science. Library guides, ask your librarian. Um, think, check, submit, all of these things are good, good resources. Thank you everyone and have a good afternoon and rest of open access week. <laughs>